Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, God has blessed the work out there in Pennsylvania. We thank God for it. I had 15 people vote me in when I came out there, and I ran most of those off shortly after that. And uh, <laughs> learned a lot in the ministry. Uh, but God has been blessing it. Lately, we've, uh, we've seen an average attendance of around 120 in the church. We saw a young couple baptized into the church to join the church this last Sunday, and a, a young lady saved in the morning service, a young, and a, um, an, elder, an older man saved in the evening service, and God's moving. He, he's not dead. He's real. And so we praise God for that. Well, I love these morning sessions. I really do. I think they're a joy. And uh, someday when you're in the ministry and you go through the daily grind of the ministry, and uh, maybe you're on the phone with the state trying to handle numbers and issues, whatever else, you realize how nice it is to be able to sit in a chapel session and be able to think about God. And, uh, and so we praise God for these times. But I did recognize that uh, right after chapel is lunch, so I'll try not to belabor. I've been accused of being a long-winded preacher lately. And uh, it reminds me of the three country preachers out my way. They got together for lunch, and they were walking home. One was a Methodist, one was a Presbyterian, one was a Baptist. And they got arguing on their way back who is the better preacher of the three. One said, no, I'm, I'm the best preacher. I said, oh, no, I'm the best preacher. And the Methodist finally spoke up. He said, well, apparently you guys haven't heard of the great revivals that happened through great Methodist preaching here in America. And the Presbyterian said, well, uh, obviously you know about Billy Sunday. He was a Presbyterian. Can't nobody preach like a Presbyterian. And the Baptist said, uh, well, I hate to remind you of a fellow in the Bible. His name was John. He was a Baptist. We Baptists can out preach all of you. So they finally decided how to settle it. They said uh, they saw a corn crib up there down the road, and they, they had found a skunk, so they thought they'd throw that skunk in the corn crib. And they said, whoever can stay in that corn crib and preach the longest with that skunk, we'll, we'll figure he's the best preacher. So the Presbyterian said, move out of the way. I'll get this settled. And he stepped in there. He started preaching. He preached 15 minutes. He preached 20 minutes. He got to 25 minutes. He came out. I said, oh, I can't take this anymore. And he stepped out of the corn crib. That Methodist said, oh, look out. And he walked in there, started preaching. He preached for 30 minutes and 40 minutes. Got almost to an hour. Finally, he stepped out. I said, man, I can't take this anymore. He stepped out of that corn crib. So that Baptist preacher went in there. Of course, he preached for 15 minutes and 20 minutes. Half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, two hours into it, the door of that corn crib popped open. Out came that skunk. He said, I can't take no more of this. <laughs> so I, I suppose it's possible we Baptist preachers can be a bit long-winded. I'll try to be mindful of the time today. Will you take your Bibles? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Thank God for the influence of this college in my life. I can remember so many times sitting in this auditorium and God's, God's power and His Spirit speaking to my heart, convicting me and working on issues in my life, preparing me for the ministry. And I thank God for it. Thank God for the men and, uh, and the women that God used in this ministry to influence my life. You, you will find you're a collection of people who've invested in you. You're not, you're not just a self-made person. You're, there are people who have invested their time and energy in you. And uh, that's a very valuable thing. You ought to, you ought to, be, uh, you ought to treasure those people who, who have cared enough for you to put time into you. Proverbs chapter 14 is where I would like to, to begin to read, uh, and I'd like to start in verse number 12 and read down through verse 15. You follow along now. The Bible says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his goings. What should you think about that phrase this morning in verse number 14? The backslider in heart should be filled with his own ways. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13 has been a very important chapter for me in the ministry. Preached a message on this years ago, and God has used it mightily in, in not only my life, but in the lives of some of the men in our church. The Bible gives us a story here of a young man. He doesn't even give us his name. It just says that he was a, a man of God and that he was out of Judah. We really don't know much more beyond that. There's not much more of a, of a detailed information about this, this person except for the time period in which he lived. And I can't help but think about this young man when I think about that phrase in Proverbs, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own way. I want you to note this, that God is always more interested in your, in your heart than he is about your outward appearance. 
You remember when God was looking for someone to anoint as king over Israel when uh, Saul had, had ceased to be faithful to God. When he was little in his own eyes, God made him great among the nation. And uh, then, then when he got lifted up in his pride, uh, then, then uh, God abased him. And so God was looking for someone to anoint to be the king to take Saul's place. And he went to the house of Jesse, and he went through all of the, all of the sons of Jesse, starting with Eliab. And, and Samuel said, boy, surely the Lord's anointed. He looked like a king. King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. Eliab was a well-built young man. And God said, don't look on, the, on his outward appearance. Don't look on his countenance or the height of his stature. For God doesn't see as man sees, for the Lord looks on the heart. And I can tell you this. You're going one of two ways this morning. It doesn't matter if you're a, a Bible college student or whether you're, you're in high school or whether you're in, 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 the, in the school. It doesn't really matter where you're at. You're going one of two ways. Either you're pursuing God or you're pursuing self. You may, you may look like you're pursuing God on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And he says, that man that's a backslider in his heart will be filled with his own ways. That person that is pursuing self-pleasure rather than God's, God's pleasure and seeking God, what God would have in his life will be filled with the very ways that he pursues, that he's looking for in his heart. Now let's, let's read here in 1 Kings chapter 13. The Bible says, Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. This may not sound, if you don't know the story, may not sound all that strange. Here's a, here's a king standing next to an altar burning incense, and he's going to make some kind of sacrifice. But if I could give you a little background to the story of what's going on here uh, so that you understand the context of where this, uh, young, this man of God is called into, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel has gone into a great split, massive divide. Uh, King Solomon has brought an incredible amount of wealth to Israel. He, he, the Bible says that he laid up gold so that it was the value of silver. I don't know what the current price of, a, of an ounce of gold is today or of silver, but I know that gold is much more valuable than silver. But, but God said in the time of Solomon, there was so much prosperity that silver was laid up in Jerusalem like stones. It, it was such, there was such a quantity of it in, in, the, in, the, in the city of Jerusalem that there, it was like stones laying around. I mean, it was just so much of this great wealth that had been given. But Solomon had lifted up his heart before God and began to build temples unto false gods. The Bible says Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God. We don't like to think about this, but this great man who wrote much of Proverbs and, and who, who wrote Ecclesiastes, this great man who had more wisdom than any, any other human being who'd ever walk on the face of the earth uh, aside from Jesus Christ, this great man in his end days had left God. He alludes to this in Ecclesiastes when he said, I set my heart to find out anything it was. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to know if there was an experience, I was going to know it. I was going to try whatever there was out there. Let me tell you something. The world's got a lot for you to try, but if you listen to Solomon's wisdom about it, he says it is vanity. Amen. Hey, look, uh, I've never done drugs. By God's grace, he kept me out of that culture, but I know enough about hurting people who come out of the drug culture to know drugs will blow your mind. I don't think that there's not pleasure in sin. There's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. And the Bible says that that, that, uh, that man that, that, that seeks his own self, tries to keep his life for himself, tries to experience all these pleasures, that the end of that is death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. So God said to Solomon that he was going to remove the kingdom from him, although uh, for honor and respect to Solomon, he doesn't do it in Solomon's time, but he'll do it in Solomon's son's time. And the son that would be king after Solomon would be Rehoboam. Rehoboam comes to the throne, and he's a bit of an ignorant young man, if I could say that in that way. He takes advice and counsel, and that was wise, but he took advice and counsel from two different segments. One from the older men who had ruled with his father Solomon, and one from the spoiled, rotten young men that grew up with him in the kingdom, in the palace. And the Bible says the older men said, listen, your, your dad was hard on the people. He taxed them hard. He built the house of God. He built his own houses. He built houses for his, for his wives' gods. And, and all that tax and that pressure have really burdened the people. They it brought the people to a limit. Now, if you'll be kind to the people, if you'll be gracious to the people, they'll be connected to you. So he came over here and he gets counsel from the young man. He said, oh, come on. These guys, you know, they're trying to push you. You, you. you need to be like your dad, maybe even more so. 
And so he said, well, he said, my, my father's reign, uh, that, that was little compared to what I'm going to do. I'm going to tax you harder. I'm going to work you harder. I'm going to put you people in your place. And ten tribes out of the, out of the nation of Israel left him. Uh, in, in chapter 11, uh, a prophet comes to a man by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam is an is a industrious young man. Solomon even sees the, the, the prudence of this guy. that he's, he's a hard worker. He's a go-getter. And he begins to put him in charge of things. And then Solomon notices maybe this guy's a little bit too much of a go-getter. Well, the man of God comes to him, and he happens to be walking out in the field, and this man of God walks up and takes the new garment that he had just put on. He had put some kind of robe on himself, a new, new robe, and, and the man of God takes it and rips it into 12 pieces and gives him 10. He says, this is what I'm going to do to the nation of Israel. You're going to get 10 tribes, and for respect to David, I'm going to leave a tribe for him so that, so that David's throne doesn't cease to exist, and, but you're going to get these 10 tribes, and then he says, if... Boy, this is a big word for every one of you today. If, if you'll do my ways, if you'll follow me, if you'll seek me, if you'll do right, if you'll obey me, then I'll establish your, your throne. I'll establish a kingdom for you like I did for David. I'll establish your kingdom and your throne if you'll seek me, if you'll follow me, if you'll do right. I want to say, if you're taking notes this morning, first of all, that God is looking for a man. God's looking for someone to put his power on. He's hungry for it. He's desirous for it. He desires to take some young lady out of, this, out of this college chapel this morning, or out of this chapel this morning, and put his power on your life and use you mightily for him, or some young man, and be able to lift him up and, and show his greatness through you. And that's what God was doing when he found uh, Solomon, and he gave him wisdom like no man had ever had. He was looking for a man that God could get glory through. But Solomon's heart was lifted up in his wealth and in his pride and in his possessions. So God had to shift from him, and he goes to look to his son, and his son shows no wisdom in himself. And so he shifts from him, and he goes to this man, Jeroboam, and he says, I'm looking for a man to put my power on. And Jeroboam, unfortunately, for Jeroboam's sake, doesn't, doesn't take the advice of the prophet. Instead, because he's got the northern ten tribes, he realizes that there's a chance his people might go back to Jerusalem and worship in the house of God, which was one of the wonders of the world, and that their heart would return unto David's household, and they'd kill him. So he said, I know what I'm going to do. You know, we always mess ourselves up when we come up with our own way to fix our problems. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll make some calves. Boy, that's a, that's a new concept, isn't it? <laughs> it's always worked for everybody before, hasn't it? I'll make some calves, and I'll make some altars, and I'll put one in Bethel. What a mockery. Bethel, that, that, word, that word Beth meaning house, and El meaning God, the house of God. I'll put one of my altars in the house of God, and I'll put one in the northern portion of the country in Dan, and I'll build these altars, and I'll establish my own religion, my own form, and I'll turn the people's heart away so that they, don't have, they won't have to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship. Now, I find within Jeroboam's, well, I wish we had time to teach on this, because within Jeroboam's pattern of worship, we find the New Age church movement, the seeker-friendly movement. You know what he started out with? It's too hard for you to go all the way to Jerusalem. Listen, it's too much for you to come, uh, uh, the Lord's day, come on, let's give him a few minutes, huh? And then we can get back to our lives. It's too much for you. I, I'm absolutely amazed uh, at the, this is something Rick Warren, uh, one of the uh, founders of the seeker-friendly movement, this, this concept of, of trying to ease up on God's people, if you will. Don't preach hard to them. Don't preach long messages and, and uh, let's entertain the crowds. Uh, he, said, he said, my pattern can build a big church, but it can never build a strong Christian. Now think about that. My pattern... We'll have lots of money and lots of people. We'll pack out buildings, but we will never build a strong Christian. Well, of course not. <laughs> of course not. And Jeroboam says, it's too hard for you to go to Jerusalem. Why don't you stay here? I'll build an altar for you here, and these will be uh, gods for you. You can worship these calves, and, and we'll turn your heart. And the Bible says this became a sin in Israel. This became sin in Israel. And they begin to turn their heart away. Now Jeroboam, who is the king, is standing before an altar about to offer incense. Now the Bible says he did something else as well. He made, he made, he made high places, and he took the base people to make them the priests. <laughs> do, do you know that there are qualifications that myself and other, every other pastor who steps behind these holy desks to preach, there are qualifications to us fulfilling this role? 
And it's not like the teacher's union where once you're in, you're in. The qualifications we must live by. Because God expects holiness out of his people. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. And he said, you're going to be an example unto my flock, to my people, to how they ought to be. And so, uh, so but Jeroboam says, no, 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 I'm just going to take these base people. Every once in a while, people come to me and say, well, I'd, like to be a, I'd like to be a pastor, a youth pastor. I've, I've tried working, and I can't seem to make that happen. And I've tried this, and I've tried that. I failed at everything else, so I'd like to be a pastor. <laughs> and I think, are you kidding me? And, and Jeroboam said, no, we'll take those guys who are, who are uh, dropouts and who, who fall out, who can't seem to accomplish anything in their life, who have no character to keep working, who have no character and diligence. We'll take them and we'll make them, we'll make them the priests of my system of worship. Uh, we have a uh, ministry in my hometown where, where, I, where I pastor, and, uh, and they're a seeker-friendly type. You know, they uh, rock it out for Jesus on God's great dance floor, and then they preach a little sermonette, and they send everybody home. And they've started a pattern lately of ministry where they're, they're trying to ordain as many ministers as they can. I personally know one of the women that they just ordained as a minister uh, whose life is an absolute wreck. Married multiple, multiple times. Her children dying on overdoses of drugs and, and homosexuals, all kinds of a mess. And they ordained her just recently. And on the front page of our paper, new minister at such and such church. And they're, they're ordaining all these people, trying to, trying to make them have a piece of the pie, I guess. Make them feel com committed or connected in some way. And I can't help but think about Jeroboam. Anybody who wants to can no, no, God has qualifications for this. Near Jeroboam is, and, uh, and he's turned away from God, and he's lifted up these base people to be his priests. Uh, recently in, in, in Israel, several years ago, they, they found one of his, they found his northern altar, I believe up in Dan, and you can still see the foundation place where the altar actually sat. But here in Bethel, this young man is sent, according to chapter 13, verse 1, this man of God is sent out of Judah... So the southern nation into Israel, the northern nation, to cry out against this system. And boy, it'd be good for some preachers to start really crying out against this. We have a lot of fundamental, well, quote unquote, fundamental Baptists today who are trying to, uh, trying to uh, come alongside of the, the, the seeker-friendly movement and try to follow their pattern. You know, years ago in fundamentalism, uh, they, they were the crowd coming to us trying to figure out how we were filling our churches. Now we're the crowd going to them trying to figure out how they're filling their churches. And, and, and so uh, here this man goes up and he's crying out against this system. He's calling it out. He's saying this is wrong and this is wicked. He goes by the word of the Lord. He goes by the commandment of God. And let me just say, God was just looking for some, some man. There was no talent in this young man. <laughs> God doesn't need your talent. There was no a particular beauty in this young man that made him qualify. God's beauty far, far exceeds all of ours. There was no knowledge or wisdom that this young man had that made him qualified to go and be God's man. God doesn't need your smarts. He's got his own. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, as high as the heavens are above the earth. So this, was, this young man wasn't God's man because he was something phenomenal. He was God's man because God was just looking for somebody. He had tried through Solomon and, and, and found, it's like in Ezekiel where he said, I sought for a man among them that should make up an hedge and stand in the gap. And I found none. I'm looking. I'm just looking for somebody. <laughs> and today God's still looking for somebody. Literally, I should say it this way, God's looking for nobodies that he can do something with. <laughs> and as he's looking, he finds this young man who's going to go and cry against the altar. In verse 2, and he cried against the altar, the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar. And now here's the message every preacher ought to have in his mouth. Thus saith the Lord. We've got enough of opinions today. We need to hear, thus saith the Lord. We need more of God's word. That's what we need. We need more of Jesus in our ministries. We need more of God's power in our ministries. Just thus saith the Lord. I like how this guy came. The Bible says he came and he cried against the altar. Can you imagine the meeting there? They, they probably gathered a large amount of people there in front of the altar. They're going to offer incense in front of this altar. And Jeroboam with great pomp comes up. And he's got his, uh, he's got his uh, skid row uh, prophets up there standing on either side of the altar maybe. And, and uh, he stands up and he's about to do his service. And this guy just stands up out of the middle of the crowd and and starts crying out, oh, altar, altar. Amen. That's how God uses his prophets. He said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression. Call out against it. Call out against it. We've got, we've got plenty of, uh, 
well put together, soft spoken uh, ministry today. We need some old time. God said it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. Amen. Like some old time preaching of God's word today. Really just, this is what God says about it. Not what society thinks. Or, well, you know, things have changed today. Well, I'm glad God hasn't. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yet here, here God is crying out to this man, uh, to, to Jeroboam, through this man of God. It's God's word, not the prophet's word. And he said, Behold, a child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. I just like... How'd you like to be one of those prophets stand beside the altar? <clears throat> hey, there's a king coming. He's going to come through the house of David, and he's going to burn these priests on that altar, and men's bones shall be burned on that altar. <laughs> Yikes. Maybe this wasn't such a good thing to sign up for after all, huh? And uh, he said, I'm going to give you a sign that this will happen. The altar shall be rent, and the ashes shall be poured out. The altar is going to be ripped out. It's going to be broken, and the ashes of that altar are going to pour out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again. <laughs> I don't know why Christians get so caught up in Hollywood. The Bible's way better. <laughs> Points to this guy says, seize him. Get a hold of that guy. And when he did, his arm shriveled up, and he couldn't even draw it back to himself. God said, don't touch my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. You better watch yourself calling out against a man of God. And Jeroboam says, he starts to ask the, ask the prophet, he says, uh, uh, entreat your God for me. <laughs> I want my arm back. I want to be able to retrieve it back again. And, and so the man of God entreats the Lord for him. He says, and he, the man of God entreats, uh, he said in verse 6, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored unto me. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me. Refresh thyself, and I'll give thee a reward. See, this is how it works in the world system. You get little rewards. You get a little, you get a little bone. You get a little bit of something. In, in, keep you encouraged. Keep you going. Keep you, uh, keep you happy. Keep you satisfied. Okay, you've done a nice little magic trick for the king. Uh, that was very impressive. Come home with me. Refresh yourself. I'll feed you, and I'll give you a reward. I'll give you some money for what you did. Oh, boy, I tell you, the love of money is the, is the root of all evil. And there are a lot of people that covet after wealth and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And here this, this prophet, he hears this, uh, this uh, offer given by the king. I mean, if, if just any Joe Schmo offers you the offer, that's one thing. But if a king says, I'll refresh you, that means you're eating king's food. And if a king says, I'll give you a reward, that means you're getting king's money. Boy, this is something. This ought, to, this ought to entice this young man. But look at the resolve of him. I like him here, don't you? Uh, we need this kind of man in the ministry today. We need these people to kind of, these kind of people to stand up. Uh, the king said, I'll give you a reward, verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thy house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way thou camest. So he went out another way, and returned not by the way which he came to Bethel. I like him, don't you? A good young man. A man of God. I don't expect any more out of any other man of God, but just to go with confidence and courage, not, not operating in fear, just with boldness and say, thus saith the Lord, and I'm not here uh, to be praised. I'm not here to be patted on the back. I'm just here to, to give you the word of God, and it's not really about me anyway. It's all about God. That's all I'm here for, and then step away. I don't expect any more out of any man of God today. And I wish the story would have ended right there. See, God is looking for a man, and secondly, God is ready to show his power. The Bible says in, uh, in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, I believe it is, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards God. 
You see, the glory and the praise isn't about you or about what you can do or what you have done, but what God can do through you. If there's any secret to having God's power in your life, if there's any key to being able to obtain power, the power of God in your ministry or in your life or what God is doing around you, it is simply that you just be obedient to God, do what he says to do, and get yourself out of the way so that he can get the glory. See, God's not in the business of promoting your pride. We've seen that destroy many a man. Good men in the ministry have been destroyed by pride. God said he resists the proud. He pushes proud people down. He stiff arms them. He forces them back. This isn't about your pride and what you can do. It's about you getting out of the way so that God can get glory. It was the word of the Lord after all anyway, not the word of the prophet. But you see how man's system immediately tries to reward the man? Oh, you are something. You, you marched into the northern kingdom, cried out against the altar, split it in two and poured out the ashes and spoke to the king and shriveled the king's arm up and returned the king's arm all to him. No, he didn't. God did. The Bible says the Lord got that king's arm, Jeroboam's arm, and shriveled it. And the Lord answered the, the request of the prophet to, to restore his arm back to him again. And the Lord split the altar. And the Lord made the prophecy. It was God's doing. You know, God's not looking for you to be great. God's looking to be great through you. So he's looking for a man, and he's ready to show his power. Don't think that, that well, that was years ago, back in the Old Testament, at the time of the kings, God wanted to do mighty things. No, God wanted to do, wants to do mighty things today. Yeah. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, we, say, we often say, boy, I wish I could have been there. I, I say, I wish I could have been there when he fed 5,000, don't you? I'd love to have been an observer of him just breaking that fish and breaking that bread and filling up basket after basket after basket and 12 baskets remaining after they'd all fed. I'd like to have been there. I'd like to have been there when uh, he stood at the grave of Lazarus and he, he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. You know why he had to say Lazarus? I think everybody would come out of the grave at the voice of the Lord. And out came Lazarus, sure enough, like a living mummy wrapped up. And he said, loose him. But I'd like to have been there, wouldn't you? You know what Jesus said about it? Oh, you're, you're impressed with a fig tree withering up? Greater things than these shall ye do because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. Now, I'd like to see those miracles Jesus did on the earth, but what Jesus is trying to tell you is there's greater work to be done. Hey, looking at a fig tree and... Curse the fig tree and it withers away. Presently the fig tree withered away. And the, the disciples marveled that the fig tree was so soon withered away. Jesus said, you're impressed with that? Hey, there's a greater work to be done. And I want to do it through you. And you're going to be able to do it because I go to my Father. <laughs> you're in me and I'm in my Father. And all things that the Father has is given to me. And so uh, I give those things to you. I give the power to you to be able to accomplish great things for me in this world. Great things can be done for God today. They can be. But God's looking for a man. Or God's looking for a woman that he can show his power through. Amen. He might show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. You see this? I am the vine, he said. You are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine. You're the branch. If you don't abide in me, you can't do anything. But if you abide in me, think about this. If you abide in me, you shall ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done for you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bring forth fruit. And much fruit glorifies God. You know what he's saying? If you're a branch and you're connected to the vine, you have one purpose, and that one purpose is fruit. Bear fruit. Not look pretty. Not put on nice leaves. Jesus was not impressed with the fig tree's leaves. He found on it leaves only and no fruit, and it bothered him, and he cursed the fig tree because it didn't have any fruit. So God's purpose for you is fruit. No farmer goes out and plants a field just so it looks pretty. Now, farmers are, you know, they want to make sure the rows are straight and they care about some kind of dignity. But, they, but really, they don't put all that time in, uh, in spraying the field and plowing the field and planting the field just so it looks nice. They have one thought in mind, and that's the harvest. That's fruit out of that field. That's what they want. They don't, care, they don't care so much how it looks, per se, as much how it produces. And so here we are as Christians trying to put on a facade so we look like good Christians when what God really wants is fruit. And here's what he says. If you need something in order to bear fruit, 
You're connected to me. You're in the vine. If you need something to go beyond religiosity and actually start producing fruit as a Christian, all you have to do is ask, and I'll give it to you. You know why? Because that's what I want to do in your life anyway. Amen. Oh, dear God, give me some money. <laughs> well, maybe God doesn't intend for you to have a lot of money right now. Maybe God intends you to have a lot of faith because he wants fruit. God, take care of this pain in my life, this physical illness, this distress I'm going through. Well, maybe God doesn't want to take away the physical illness or stress. Maybe he wants you to have strength. Maybe he wants you to bear fruit. God said, if you need anything, if there's anything that you lack, if you need anything to produce fruit, if you ask me, I'm certainly going to do it because I want you to bear fruit. If you need something in order to serve God in the ministry, ask him for it. If somehow you feel you can't produce fruit in the ministry, ask God for it. But listen, it's easy to produce the leaves and look like a Christian. Well, God wants his fruit out of your life. Here is my Father glorified. And he's trying. He wants to show his power. We say, Lord, use me. He wants to use you. Maybe I ought to say, Lord, make me usable. Lord, make me a usable vessel. Let me say this. I've said that God is looking for a man and God is ready to show his power. Let me say this last. And I'll close. God expects faithfulness. The expectation of God towards his servants is not for them to come up with witty sayings. The expectation for God is not that they might just be amazing to everybody else. It's not God's expectation that they have all their ducks in a row and everything put together so neatly. It's God's expectation that you go and do what he told you to do, be obedient to him, and do it faithfully. Faithfully. The field God may call you to may not be the biggest one. It may not be the flashiest, the showiest, or the richest. But the field God calls you to is the field God wants you at. Amen. I remember time in my ministry, and I'll be quick with this illustration, but I had a man, a, a, a pastor who's pastored in my area for over 30 years, and and to be an encouragement to me, he had called me up and he said, uh, I'd like to take you out to lunch. And so we went out to, to lunch together and we were sitting there and he asked me, he just said, hey, how are things going? I'd been in, in the ministry for a little while at that point and uh, had gone through some ups and downs in the ministry. At that point, I was going through one of those down moments and, and I always try to be upbeat and encouraging because God is good, isn't he? Even if it seems like it's terrible, it's still great to serve Jesus and uh, try to be encouraging. But uh, he was a, he's a very kind man and I love him to death. And he, he was just oh, trying to be open to me and he's, how are you doing? How are things going and what's going on and, and I just I said can I just be honest with you and tell you I'm struggling right now the church seems like it's falling apart and everything I do seems like it's a mess and I can't seem to get things going forward and I and in frustration I made this statement I said I just want this ministry to be a success he's a very patient very loving man older man in the ministry and he just sat quiet for a second and he said Mark because I want you to when you go home I want you to get your Bible out and I want you to look up how many times God puts the word success in the Bible no, no, he said, never mind, don't do that, I'll tell you. He said, it says one time. He told Joshua, then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt be a good success. What I'd really like you to do is go home and look up how many times God puts the word faithfulness in the book. So God didn't call you to be a success. Because your ideas of success and God's ideas of success are completely different. God called you to be faithful to go where he told you to go, to say what he told you to say, to do what he told you to do, and do it until he comes back. We get so caught up and distracted by all these other things going around when really, hey, th those of us in the ministry, we have a field to plow and a field to plant and a field to harvest, and we ought to focus on that. So this is where God sent me. This is what God wants me to do. And I'll do, I'll, if, if there's any word of success that we need, it is faithfulness in the ministry that God's called us to. I've seen men get discouraged and quit the ministry because their idea of success was not what, what they thought it was going to be. So God expects faithfulness. It's required in stewards. We find here in the text uh, that the Bible says here uh, in, verse number se in verse number 11 that uh, this prophet, he starts to head home in verse number 10. And there's being noised about in Israel what went on. I mean, this is a big deal. Everybody's talking about it. The altar is broken. Uh, Jeroboam is put to shame. And this prophet comes in and marches back out. Now there dwelt, in verse number 11, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. In the house of God, there was an old prophet. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told unto their father. And their father said unto them, what, what, what way went he? 
for his sons had seen the, what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto them, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go, go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, uh, nor turn again by, this, by the way which thou camest. A any confusion here about what God wants this young man to do? He seems clear about it, doesn't he? God told me, go, cry against the altar, don't eat bread, don't drink water, don't go back the same way, and get out of that place. Get in, get your job done, and get back out, and that's what you're supposed to do. This young man is completely clear about what God wants me to do. Verse 18, and he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. I'd have to ask them, why didn't you in Bethel go cry against the altar? <laughs> and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Paul said, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Listen, an angel's words do not usurp the words of God. There are many fallen angels and, and angels that are in devil, devil realms and principalities and powers, and they don't, they don't precede the word of the Lord. And yet this man comes and he says, an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. He lied. And he said, come on, eat, eat, eat bread with me and drink water. And this young man takes it, hook, line, and sinker. Oh, well, if you're a prophet, just like I am, great. The Bible says, brethren, try the spirits to see if they be of God. Because not everyone that says that they're of God is of God. Not every preacher who gets up and says he's going to preach the word of the Lord to you is preaching the word of the Lord to you. So you need to know not only the spirit of God, but the word of God, familiar enough that you can sense when it's not God's spirit and not God's power. This young man wasn't, he wasn't there. He knew what God wanted. He should have accomplished what God wanted. But he turned back in verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Now he is going to prove that he is a prophet. Now, you remember how the young man cried out before the altar? What do you think that sounded like? In a crowd of people, the king up in front of them at the altar, probably in some open air meeting, you know, and they're, they're about to make this sacrifice, and that young man cries out, Oh, altar, altar! The Bible says he cried out, didn't he? Now watch the text here. They're sitting at meat, at meat eating bread, drinking water, laid back, uh, talking about old times, having a casual conversation, and the word of God comes into this old man, and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah. Can you imagine that shock? <laughs> Saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And then they went back to eating. Awkward. Huh? You think he swallowed hard after that? Can you imagine him sitting there, bread and water, and having a good time, talking about being prophets and how cool it is to be God's man and go yell at people? This is wonderful. It's good stuff. He's talking about just kind of hobnobbing one another. We're, about, we're both prophets. Isn't that great? And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord comes to this old prophet, and he cries out to the young man and says, Your carcass won't even come to your father's sepulchers. That means more than just you're going to die. That means you're going to die tragically away from your homeland. And they won't be able to bring your bones back to your dad's sepulcher. So they finish eating. Strange meal. I think that had to be like Saul's meal with that witch of Endor, don't you think? So they, they eat, finish the meal, if you will. Verse, uh, verse number 20, uh, 22, or I'm sorry, verse number 23. It came to pass that after he had eaten bread and after that he had drunk, he saddled for him the ass to wit... For the prophet whom he had brought back, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. I'm out of time, but I want you to get this picture. Here's this man of God laying there dead in the street. And a lion on one side of him, 
and a donkey on the other. And everybody knows that's the young man who just cried against the altar. What do you think that did to his message against the altar? The Bible says a just man falling down before the wicked is like a troubled fountain in a corrupt spring. A lot of damage has been done by people, and I, mean, I think good people, who just backslid. Somewhere in that young man's heart, he thought, boy, it would have been nice to take up that king on his offer. I could be walking home with money in my pockets. And he sat down under an oak tree to think about it for a while, and then the opportunity came. Come on back. Come on back. The devil is a deceiver. And he starts in your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And what God is saying is your heart needs to be stirred for God and, and, and trying to please God. Won't you seek God? Won't you seek his face? I'm certain with all my heart that inside this room today, God has people that he wants to use in a mighty way. But you need to put yourself aside so God can be glorified because God's looking for a man. God's looking for a woman. He's looking to show his mighty power through them. But God expects faithfulness. He demands faithfulness. And this young man learned the hard way. The hard way he learned by disobeying God, you bring God's judgment on your life personally. You do. It's your choice. This is what we call a healthy fear of God. Not that we tremble every time we think about God, but that we say, if I offend God, he who is just has to deal with sin and he will deal with sin in my life. That goes deep into the heart, doesn't it? Let's stand